going to be run, um, you know, the sort of day-to-day -day functioning of, of um, who, like this judge is going to do this trial today, you are going to do the delinquency docket today. I don't do that because my duties as chief administrative judge take me out of the building so often that it's not a good idea for me to also be the presiding judge. Back in 1997 to 2002, I tried to do both. I found that pretty stressful and pretty difficult to handle. Um, so um, I advise the chief court administrator on policy. I advise all the judges all over the state on changes in policy, you know, on anything that's coming. I tell them, um, I, I, I take their calls, they call me for advice, but to say that I, 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 don't, I don't think I really run any court in particular. I don't tell the judge, I mean, I might give them advice on how to run their court. If I look at their numbers and it looks like their, their backlog seems to be creeping up, I might ask them what the problem is, I might try to help them with that. Um, but I don't really have a total supervisory authority over the other judges, the way you might think I would. Yeah, no, I, I thought, I don't know, for some reason I thought it was different. You know, that you were not running a court. I thought that you was kind of special. You well, know, I'm, I'm sitting in court, and I'm hearing trials, and I'm doing dockets, um, and I try to do as much as a, a court as I can. Um, I keep asking for more of it, as a matter of fact. Now I'm doing a little bit more because I just lost, I had, we had four judges in Hartford. We're down to three, so it's just me and two others. Um, but I feel it's important for me to stay on the bench because that's how I see how things are working, and that's how I see what's going right and what's going wrong. Yeah, but you're not on the bench. I am on the bench. But just not not not, not every day. Not every day. But okay. at least at least two or three days a week, I'm on the bench. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you, Judge. Mm -hmm. Anything further? Thanks very much, Honor. Right. Thank you. Next is the Honorable uh, Raymond R. Norco of Hartford. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. Thank you. Thanks for your patience during a long day. Thank you. We'd be happy to have any opening statement. Senator McDonald, Representative Lawler, members of the Judiciary Committee, thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify before you today. I also want to thank the Governor and her wisdom for nominating me for reappointment for the fourth term. Since I've talked to you last, which was approximately 2002, they merged GA-16 into the GA-14 jurisdiction. I spent one year in community court before leaving. I sat in Manchester court for three years as the presiding judge, sent to Waterbury's as an arraignment judge for one year, sent to Enfield, and, and uh, spent a couple of months in Enfield, and then was returned to the community court in Hartford. I've been the uh, PJ in community court in Hartford since October of 08. Uh, the community court was honored uh, by the US, U.S. Department of Justice as a mentor court. Three of us in the United States have uh, had been so designated. Our jurisdiction in community court is obviously quality of life crimes. The uh, Senate, as uh, Justice uh, Judge Damiani has indicated, we are the ones that apply the social services to the judicial applications. Uh, last year, the community court case caseload increased 33 percent. We went from approximately 7,500 cases per year to 13,600. Of that 13,600, probably 13,000 of those cases passed under my door. Um, I look forward to any questions from the committee. Thanks very much. Uh, one uh, other thing, Senator. Yes, um, sir. The, the Chief Justice, in her wisdom, also appointed me as the uh, chair, co-chair with Judge Bizzuto on the Committee on Self-Representation. We've uh, had a committee of 26, made 23 recommendations. The committee of six, uh, committee of 20, 26 has been whittled down to six. We're now implementing uh, the recommendations of the committee of the whole. Two successes we've had in pilot programs, which are uh, somewhat prominent, are the Greeter program down in New Haven and a pilot project in which we took an experienced courthouse employee. He gave her a beautiful blue vest with a Connecticut uh, motto on it, and she basically greeted people at the door and her first uh, day at uh, so-called work, uh, she had 71 inquiries in which she directed people, which we considered an en enormous success and continue that program in other jurisdictions. The second is we started advice-only days, volunteer attorneys in the city of Hartford uh, at the family court once a week to give an hour and a half of their time to people who have questions about the court process. That has also been very successful thus far. 
I await your questions. I appreciate that. Uh, we're down to about a committee of six. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I appreciate uh, that. Is that is that system um, – I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you called it, the, the second it part is. of it. The, uh, the advice-only day, um, that's a pilot project also. Hartford is the first designation. It's at 90 Washington Street. Most of the self-represented issues center around family law in one form or another. The third element that we're sort of working on very carefully is unbundling and unbundling in the foreclosure area to allow counsel to basically come in and out uh, under a certain set of circumstances and also family laws under consideration. The unbundling project is uh, in the distance because the Chief Justice in her wisdom wants us to make sure that the advice only program works and is documented. I, uh, what's the unbundling program? Um, that's just the recommendation of the, of the uh, Committee on Self-Representation. One of the recommendations is to unbundle in certain areas uh, to allow counsel to come in uh, in that way more people would be able to afford counsel such as the foreclosure procedure. You would, you would splice that apart and allow counsel to have appearances for certain sections of the foreclosure rather than holding counsel for the full, full appearance for the full process such as the pre-mediation section, the mediation section, or the legal side, which is always going on, why the mediation and the pre-mediation sections are always being addressed. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Uh, any questions? Senator Kissel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's great to see you, Your Honor. Mr. Kissel. Senator Kissel. You've made a, a big difference in a lot of different areas, and I congratulate you on the progress between the, the meeting that we had last year uh, between the, uh, the bench and the bar and folks here on the Judiciary Committee. I know that you had spoken at that time regarding efforts regarding pro se's, and it seems like we're making some progress. Uh, on the greeter uh, portion, uh, you had indicated that this individual uh, basically gave directions and guidance to 71 folks on the first day of operation. How, what kind of impact did that have on the rest of the court's workings? Um, the initial pilot project was in New Haven. Uh, the uh, chief clerk there, Mr. Sadik, originally was a little skeptical that he could provide an experienced employee that would enjoy that particular process. However, on the first day, to have someone at the door at the actual metal right after that, rather than having the marshals uh, give them somewhat indirect answers, it was, it was very beneficial to have this woman who was a very experienced judicial employee give the proper answers, proper directions. Um, and they even went so far as having the files pulled in the court, courtrooms that they were going that was allowed and it facilitated, it, it, it was uh, greeted warmly by the public because of the designation of the blazer and, the, and the, that the state cared for this particular issue and was providing some help to them. I think that makes a, a, a huge difference. I bet you as it rolls forward, we'll find that uh, it will have a direct impact. I know when I first started practicing law, I would have liked a greeter too because uh, just trying to find your way around the courthouses. Well, up in Enfield where you're from, there's a, there's a, there was last year when I was there, there was a uh, a wonderful elderly woman that used to come in two days a week on a volunteer who knew the system backwards and forward, and she was sort of the unofficial greeter and did a good job. That's great, great news to know, and I appreciate the fact that you recalled that I'm from the greater Renfield area. Uh, practiced uh, many, many years in GA 13, uh, and also as a special public defender in that courthouse. Uh, hopefully it's still operating very smoothly. Uh, the other area uh, of interest that I have is, you know, obviously we're, we're struggling as far as resources. How was the community court able to handle such a dramatic increase in caseload when I'm guessing there weren't a lot of additional resources to go with that? Um, the absorption rate of the community court is a very fascinating process. What I found, you know, I remember I was there for four years before I left, and then two judges filled in in between. So those judges uh, basically worked on my original design, some expansion, some contraction. Um, the beauty that happened last year during the expansion period is that the nonprofit community came forward to basically align themselves with the court. It was an interesting phenomenon. Almost on a monthly basis, a different agency came forward. And I'll give you an example, C Connecticut uh, CHS. CHS came with a program called AMIR, which is American African Men in Recovery, offered us a person and said, this is the program we have. It would integrate with the court. And we found expansion like that uh, just a natural phenomenon. And the CHS program, there's a gentleman named George Dillon, has been phenomenal. It's taken out men that I would consider on the end of the structure, uh, people that most of our society would, would, would basically put off the books and basically turn them around. That happened in many instances. We have a program called PVG, which Reverend Kaysen 
takes out 17 to 21 year old usually uh, minority kids and basically works on them for four weeks and, and has a tremendous success rate. Um, since it's me at the community court, you just, you just learn to take the new numbers and you, you deal with them. Uh, some of the questions concerning what, uh, what, what application the, uh, the budget re budgetary restrictions have, I mean, it was slower processing, slower transportation. Um, I'm concerned about the fact that uh, in the community court, it's a, it's a lone building, what I call monastic courts, uh, Manchester's like that, where you're judged by yourself most of the time or one other colleague. And I'm always concerned about security, people coming in directly in the front door. I mean, one of the suggestions I had a couple years ago, which was uh, basically looked at by judicial, was that there should be a stadium at each door with a weapon because someone can come in the front door and uh, basically wipe us out with no problem. I always remember sitting in Manchester and I had a 76-year-old gentleman with a Uzi and 10,000 rounds in a cabinet that wouldn't house your best silverware. And uh, I, I always said to myself, if that gentleman showed up at the door with the gun, they, we would all be uh, having trouble. Well, that, that's a scary thought, especially given the prior testimony from, from your, some of the, the previous judges regarding the lack of marshals in our, our court system. Uh, my, my last question is, with the great success and actually national award-winning community court that, that my recollection was your brainchild and, you, you know, you, you deserve an, an awful lot, if not all, of the credit for it. How come we're not replicating this in other parts of the state? And it can't be, it can't be just resources because it sounds to me that the communities where this court is located benefit exponentially not only by their decrease in victimization, but the way the punishment might meet the crime and it's, it, the way it's interwoven with nonprofits and these other charities. I mean, I here's something that, you know, we always talk about what doesn't work. Here's something that's really working very well. How come we can't replicate that? I mean, before I answer that question, I'll say one other question. Who we criminalize in our society is, is a question we don't spend enough time on. I mean, people, we criminalize kids, we criminalize middle adults for stuff that should be basically filtered through the system with a dismissal at some point. If the social services application is applied, that's, what, that, that's how community courts survive, the word dismissal. I have gentlemen in front of me that have 72 hits, and they'll ask me before they serve community service, is it going to be on my record? And you sort of say to yourself, no, but. And then you have the other person, of course, who does something foolish that should not have a criminal record that gets the dismissal on the clean record. Why it's not replicated? It's a delicate baby to balance. I mean, you have to have prosecution that's interested. You have to have a prosecution that accepts the fact that judicial application requires social services application as a uh, inroads. Jail is not the answer. You have to have the resources of the community. Hartford exists because of the Berry Square Parish. St. Augustine's Church in the basement. A, a bunch of uh, citizens there said we had enough of a quality of life crime, went to basically to the city, the city went to judicial, Judge Ment was a uh, chief court administrator, uh, liked the idea and it gave birth. We tried New Haven at one time, New Haven didn't want to follow through on certain aspects, it didn't have the community interest. Waterbury has a community court, but it doesn't have full, full backing of the structure. Uh, without full backing, money's just not gonna do it. You need, you need all the, parties committed. And I always remember my first meeting on community court when I put it together, there were 26 agencies in the room and the only word I heard was no. It's a difficult process. Well, Judge Norco, uh, I followed your career for a long time. You've done an excellent, excellent job. Uh, and the community court located in Hartford, you know, Hartford gets a bad rap on an awful lot of things, but here's something that's really worked very well. Uh, and the judicial branch just there's an awful lot of credit for continuing with this and your efforts are well noted as also. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Are there other questions? Um, Judge Snook, I, I missed the first part. Did someone ask you about resources in the court, yes. et cetera? Um, like Judge Damiani and the other criminal judges have been here, interpreters, marshals, transportation, all those are you have to scrounge for them. You have to, and most of the time I have a full-time interpreter. Most of the time I'm sh sharing my interpreter with the housing court, which is right behind the community court. Uh, and is that different from the case, let's say, a couple of years ago? Yes, I had a full-time interpreter with no questions, so you, you always had someone in the room. Um, the second is the transportation issues with marshals. Uh, it slows up. My, my clients, my jail clients come from GA-14, so they have to be taken to 14 and then from 14 transferred 
to community court. That, that sometimes backs up and uh, slows the system down. I mean, in to fairness to judicial, uh, Judge Quinn and Judge uh, uh, Chase have done an excellent job in trying to basically overlay the system for everybody's support, but at some, at some points it slows the structure down completely. And, uh, um, and, and w in terms of the sentencing options, I mean, obviously in, this, in the community court, you're relying a lot on community-based sanctions in many ways. Uh, uh, not so much the court personnel, but let's say probation, parole, halfway houses, et cetera. It, have you noticed any difference there in the last couple of years? Or do you have fewer or more or just the same? Actually, or? I just had a new public defender. And one thing, she came over from GA-14, and the one observation she made, which was in, of interest to me, was that uh, we, we get programs better. I, I really had no difficulties. If I need a bed, it usually comes within the, the period of time. Um, what I have is a better panel of, of nonprofit agencies from the outpatient standpoint that I can mm -hmm. use based upon their interaction with the court. I mean, what I'm finding, not to go back to the same point, Senator, is that nonprofits are coming to me and, and they're looking at the legitimate work of the court, and the legitimate work of community court crosses with their institutional mission. So they're, they're very they volunteer many times to come in to help the court out. In, for an instance, we lost the Paul and Lisa Foundation grant that was not refunded for monetary reasons that basically gave, uh, set up programs for prostitutes. When, when it happened, uh, Charter Oath Help came forward and, and has basically done an admirable job of filling in where mm -hmm. the Paul and Lisa program was before. That's been happening very frequently. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much. If there's uh, no other questions, uh, Thanks again, Your Honor. Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Roll Down, I didn't see you. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have no questions. I just really want to acknowledge and thank the judge for all of his work. I know that it is fairly self-evident based on the testimony that he submitted that this is not just a basic judgeship, but that he is really extremely involved in the community. And we're very grateful to have him in Hartford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. And congratulations again, Judge. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, next, we have two nominees uh, to be senior judges. First is the Honorable Jonathan J. Kaplan of South Windsor. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony 